By way of uh, a little introduction, uh, my, my first Lakeland that I remember seeing in the show ring likewise captivated me, uh, a little bitch named Brazen Blonde of Oz. Uh, and unfortunately, Zsa, Zsa was killed in an automobile accident before she ever had puppies. But uh, she created a picture in my mind of an incredibly agile, athletic, graceful, and yet strong little terrier. And that is the image that I still carry to this day. And I've had the pleasure, since I've been doing this for a long time, to carry pictures in my mind of many of both the top winning and top producing, and those don't always go together. We need to remember that. And we'll point that out when we have the dogs here. Uh, that occasionally the top producing dogs are not going to be your top show dogs. And again, I remind you when you're judging, uh, you are judging breeding stock and the dogs should be more than glamorous. Uh, this is a very functional breed. And believe me, they can still function as vermin hunters with little or no training. Uh, they take to it still very naturally, the vast majority of them, given the opportunity. They go to ground and work game with intensity and enthusiasm. And intensity and enthusiasm are two of the characteristics that describe this breed well. And so we can start with a discussion of temperament, uh, particularly in this day and age where dog fighting is an anathema and we have discussions about sparring terriers and what's appropriate and what's not. Uh, Lakelands are penalized in the standard for shyness and particularly sharp shyness. Any tendency to react in their shyness and, and bite. Major no-no. By the same token, they were bred to hunt in the company of hounds, often to live with the hounds. These are big foxhound types. Uh, as tough as the Lakeland is, they'd better learn to get along with those hounds, not fight with them. And likewise, their primary attention should not be killing each other. So if you bring dogs out to look at each other, fine, great, do it, by all means. And they will sh and should show interest in each other. It should not be primarily exhibited as aggression. Curiosity, I can stand up on my tippy toes higher than you can stand on your tippy toes. Not a whole lot beyond that. Now, granted, you've got bitches in season, you bring out experienced stud dogs, and they may be claiming turf. And they can lift their lip a little bit and kind of, mm. but they should not be flinging themselves at each other. And this, frankly, can be a measure of sound temperament, that you bring dogs out and they show interest in each other. And they may challenge each other marginally but they should not be flying out at the end of the lead, snapping and snarling under any circumstances. And I'm sorry, I, I would fault this. Again, remember, yes, they're show dogs and they're beautiful creatures, but they're first and foremost companion dogs. And so overly aggressive dogs serve no one any purpose. And that kind of temperament should not be rewarded. Uh, 
for those of you who may come from other breeds, how many of you, ha your primary breed is, say, other than a terrier breed? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and include this. Um, there are three terrier breeds that we often confuse fine points of type because they're similar in basic construction and size. And that's a wire fox terrier, a Lakeland, and a Welsh. Uh, for those of you who come from a sporting dog perspective, think of it in terms of the three setters. Now, people look at the three setters, they say, well, except for color, they're all the same. Of course they're not. No. Not at all. <laughs> and so I would say the same for these three terriers. And if I were to equate the three, the Welsh Terrier would be the Gordon, more substance, uh, more s rather doer nature, a little more sober-sided. I would equate the Lakeland to the English Setter. Uh, happy-go-lucky, moderate in overall type and conformation, and then the Fox Terrier and the Show-Off Irish Setter. Again, most extreme of the three setters, most refined of the three setters, where the extremes of type, general setterness, as compared to your square, long-legged terrier, they are both the most extreme. And so, uh, working dogs, Malamutes and Huskies, both big, hairy sled dogs. Well, yeah, oh. and... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but very, very different breeds. And so it is incumbent upon you judges to educate yourselves in the subtleties of breed type. And think in terms of the Lakeland as he's the smallest of the three breeds, Welsh Wire Lakeland. Uh, and this is because the, the terrain where he hunts, the Lake District is mountainous, it's very rocky. The fox dens where they hunt are in these rocky crevices in the mountainside. So the dog needs legs long enough to cover rocky, hilly terrain because these dogs are not carried in saddlebags. They don't hunt with the hunters on horseback. They hunt with a few couples of hounds on foot. So long legs to cover the terrain, narrow enough to fit into the rocky dens, and tough enough with a strong enough head to dispatch the Westmoreland fox, which is one of the largest fox types in England. The Welsh Terrier, Wales is a less severe landscape with big open dens for both badger and fox as opposed to the narrow rocky dens. And frankly, our fox terrier cousins are some distance from their hunting roots structurally. They're the tallest of the three terrier breeds in most cases. You'll get you know, Welsh and wires that run in the same general height range. Lakeland's figure, 13 and a half to 15, bottom top. Ideal for males, 14 and a half. The wording is bitches as much as an inch less with half an inch deviation either way. So that's going to take you from just over 13 to 15. You're not going to find a lot of fox terriers or Welsh terriers that are under 14 and a half, bitches or dogs. And some of them are pushing 16. 
I, in my 35 years in Lakelands, have never seen a winning Lakeland that was over 15 inches. Uh, and again, remember that height at the withers, where we measure them, is only one aspect of the overall size of the dog. Uh, we did go through a period in Lakelands where they were running toward rather low-legged, big-bodied dogs, and there are still some that follow that general make and shape. Again, think of the function long-legged, narrow, che deep chest. Form follows function, and in this case, defines breed type. The old adage is, anything their head can fit through, their body can fit through. And, you know, in uh, Parson Russell's, they span them. Well, you're not going to span a lot of Lakelands. Uh, it's a little different make and shape because, of course, it's a little larger dog, and they tend to have a little more breadth across the top of their back as opposed to the basic oval shape. I'll show you. Uh, say, for instance, uh, a Parson Russell is going to be essentially oval. Uh, a Welsh Terrier is going to be broadest across the back and deep chested and, you know, he's going to have the biggest body. The Lakeland is somewhere in between in that uh, you're going to have them broadest across the beam there, but then they come down to a comparatively narrow, deep, but deep chest. And this depth of chest is something that develops as they mature. It's not something that they often have as young puppies. And again, we'll have a chance to illustrate that uh, when we have the live dog demonstration because we have two teenagers, litter mates, that illustrate this very, very well. If these were mature dogs, you would say they're much too racy uh, and lacking in substance. Lakelands, the best Lakelands, in my view, tend for a small breed to be slow maturers. Lakelands that mature and look fabulous at a year of age, you're probably not going to want to look at real hard when they're three. Uh, by way of illustration, my flirt, we never showed as a puppy. Uh, she didn't go to her first dog show till she was about 14 months old. She didn't start serious winning until she was almost three. She won the breed at the garden and was third in the group when she was eight years old and had had four litters of puppies and looked essentially the same as she did when she was three or four. So, again, when you're judging this breed, take into account that often the best ones for a small breed are very slow to mature. You don't want them to look finished before they're 18 months old. Um, so, Again, we'll, let's start at the head now and work back. Now that we've done kind of the comparison thing with some of the other terrier breeds. But before I do that, are there any questions based on those comparisons? And do you have any questions as comparing them to any other terrier breeds? Okay, fine. Uh, let's start at the head. You know, uh, most people will say who love purebred dogs, no head, no, no breed type. And this is true of the Lakeland. Again, 
the head probably as much as any other part of the dog is a picture of moderation. Uh, equal length from occiput to stop, which is barely perceptible, stop to muzzle. Again, comparing them to uh, their cousins, the Welsh Terrier, again, is going to be equal, front to back. Uh, the wire, of course, it seems the longer the better. Uh, there are Lakelands that can be too short in the muzzle. Again, you'll tend to lose some strength then, or too long. And whereas there are Lakelands that will have the longer muzzle that still have a very strong muzzle, the goal is moderation. So even if they've got the strength in their muzzle, and when you hold their muzzle in your hand, you want it to fill your hand, even on some of the smaller bitches. You've got to figure, this is a dog that is dispatching a very angry, formidable foe. You want big teeth for the size of the dog. You don't want little skanky teeth. You want big, strong teeth. Level or scissors bite, both equally acceptable. No preference given to one over the other. And the only disqualification in the breed other than uh, the testicles is undershot or overshot bite. So if you get any deviation from level or scissors, crowded or crooked teeth, you're going to have to factor this in as a, a significant issue. If you've got crowding, look, is that muzzle underdeveloped? Are the teeth crowded because you're trying to fit big teeth into a narrow jaw? So actually, it's not that the crooked teeth are so dastardly. It's what they indicate. They indicate that the jaw is not broad enough to accommodate those teeth. And that's a no-no. Now, if you say Welsh and Lakelands both have the same proportions front to back, well, what's the difference? The Welsh Terrier head is wedge-shaped. It's broadest between the ears, narrows between the eyes, and then tapers slightly in the muzzle. So you've got clean, you don't want big bulging cheekbones, but it tapers. On both breeds, top skull flat. Slight stop, long muzzle. The Fox Terrier, of course, the narrowest of the three breeds, and again, flat head planes. The Lakeland head equated to a brick. Smooth sides, rectangular as opposed to wedge-shaped. And you want it to fill your hand, particularly on the boys, but don't give the girls too much of a break there. You allow for their femininity, but that fox isn't going to ask, are you a boy or a girl? <laughs> so remember, strength. Now, the Lakeland musculature, and it starts in the head and works its way back. You think strength, you think big bulging muscles. No. This is like comparing a wide receiver in football to a power back. They're both very strong, capable athletes but they serve different functions. And if you get a dog that's too muscle bound, they're not going to be able to handle the terrain.
flexibility is what you're looking for. So their musculature tends to be flat and solid. One of the things, and again, we'll show this when we go over the demo dogs. Uh, one of the things I love to do to evaluate the whole front assembly is to bring my hands up on either side of their neck behind their ears and come down their neck over their shoulders and into their rib cage. And it should just very gradually and moderately widen. You don't want to ever get a sense of you're hitting bulges. Nowhere. It's all smooth. On some Lakelands, unfortunately, you'll come down the neck. You'll hit the shoulders that are up here in their neck somewhere, and your hands stop. You've got a ridge of bone and muscle. This is not a front that is going to be able to fold up on itself and put those long legs, because the Lakeland doesn't go down the hole on its chest. If you've ever watched them in a natural earth, what they tend to do is they'll go in head first, and as soon as they can, they kind of shift over to their side. It frees up their legs to help dig, and so flexibility. They've got to be able to kind of do this and still have their head free to contact quarry. And then you've got the power rear to push, get them down there. But they're just kind of guiding with the front. The power's not through here, it's back in their butt. And again, you'll see that on, on the, the live dogs. So they kind of ease themselves in. And this is one of the areas where people who are unfamiliar with terrier front assembly, um, and I'll refer you to the illustrated standard, and we'll do some drawings too, uh, because angulation in a terrier, a good angulation in a long-legged terrier is a rather unique characteristic. It's not the same as good angulation in many working and sporting breeds. Uh, it's a little different proportion. Where's my skeleton here? Uh, page 21. And it is achieved, if you look at the top, by a comparatively long scapula. to a shorter humerus. This allows you to get the layback of the scapula and still have what they call the straight terrier front. Uh, if you get the scapula up here and you've got your neck coming here, then you're going to get a top line that just, ba well, that's a little, let me do this. I can do better than that. <laughs> One would hope. If you've got an upright shoulder, the neck is going to tend to do that. And you don't get any crest, those of you like that. You see, that's going to require that the shoulder be back there. The Lakeland withers are rather high. 
that's to accommodate this shoulder blade. Doesn't mean they've got a dip here. It just means that the neck comes down, you've got a higher wither and then a strong level top line. If the shoulders are up here, you're not going to have that. It's going to be more like that. If you've got a humerus that's too long, then they're going to tend to be pigeon-breasted and the leg's going to be here. They can't get that leg out in front of them then when they're underground. When they've got the correct assembly with the high wither, with reasonable layback, the shorter humerus, that gives them the flexibility. This is still, you've got the angulation there. This is shorter, so it allows them to bring that leg out in front of them and work underground. And yet, they still have sufficient angulation that when they're above ground and trying to cover rough terrain, they still have sufficient angulation here to move tirelessly over a long distance uh, because they can extend their leg forward and back to cover ground with a minimum of steps. So that's what we mean by a correct terrier front. This isn't going to work on a Doberman or a Setter. To go with this moderate angulation in front, and this again is an area where Lakelands and Fox Terriers tend to diverge, uh, they are not supposed to be over angulated behind either. You've got to remember if they're going to move with peak efficiency and not interfere with themselves and put too much stress on one end or the other, the angulation in the forequarter is going to have to approximate the angulation in the hindquarter. And they can, accom they can accommodate for that if they're longer back 